that you have designed on this your great day of atonement. You have promised to teach through the power of your Holy Spirit the truths that we need to understand to be able to cooperate with you in everything you've said and done on this earth. We recognize that of ourselves there is not a possibility of accomplishing a thing for you. And so we claim the life and death of your Son to be imputed and imparted in us through the power of the Holy Spirit that we may be born again and have the victory that your Son has got to be living in us. Glorify thy name this day that we may rightly discern truth and stand for truth and nothing but truth be alive in us. In Jesus' name, amen. The title of today's sermon, The Hellish Torch of Satan in God's Church. We are beginning a series that will get very personal and very disconcerting to some people. But I will not give my opinion in any of it. For I feel my opinion and any other people's opinions are of zero value. We have seen in Revelation 12 the pure church. Clothed with the pure gospel, she brings forth much glory to our Heavenly Father. Yet as we follow her progression through time, we find she is left her first love for an illicit affair with the world. But not just anyone. Speaking of this mother of harlots, which the pure church had become, we read in Revelation 18, verse 3, for how much? All nations, All nations have drunk the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. 
Now, I promise you we would be spending a good length of time in Revelation 18, 1 to 4, and guess what? This is sermon number one. We are going to understand some stuff that is very serious. All nations are involved with this corrupt whore. Amen. Elder Haskell in 1905, the seer of Patmos, page 291, wrote, The pure rep woman represents the pure church of God. A prostitute, this church, when it turns from its lawful husband and commits adultery with the kings of the earth. Note, Haskell is linking both the pure church of Revelation 12 and the whore of Revelation 18. What causes the downfall? The turn from lawful husband. All right. The woman, the church, turned from her lawful husband, which is who? Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ. Notice how this, how this turning away, notice what happens. Continuing on page 292. The church tolerated those who held false doctrines and certain sects of philosophers who applied the reason of the Greeks to what? The study of God's Word. The study of God's Word. And what will that do to the study of God's Word? Perverted. Perverted, that's correct. This dangerous compromise of the standards of truth caused the whole church to become a foul system of wickedness and death. The philosophy of the world destroys the truth from God's Word. The most deadly is that which at first glance and even casual study of the biblical truths of God's Word sounds and looks like it's truth. This historical fact alone should have been a warning enough to Seventh-day Adventists to guard against any influence of Greek and Roman philosophy in our church leadership and in our educational systems. Yeah. Yet we did not, and in fact we welcomed and sought after those who held degrees of the world to make the church more acceptable to the world. Mm -hmm. Therefore, because of this, Elder Haskell puts forth the next phase. Paganism walked bodily into the church. And the leader of paganism claimed once the bride, once pure church as whose bride? His bride. His bride. A false prophecy. A false spirit of prophecy false interpretation of scriptures, the exaltation of reason, the love of worldly ways, the desire for money and positions in the government, and finally, a demand for the crown itself. These are what wrought the change from purity, simplicity, gentleness to the condition of what? Prostitute. Prostitute. Notice, we have a list of seven things. Elder Haskell in this quotation has given us a list of seven things that results, the results of apostasy. Which only begins because of the effect of paganism being allowed into the church and tolerated there. The first, the, a false spirit of prophecy. What is the true spirit of prophecy? Those who have been here for a while know what the true spirit of prophecy is. What is a true spirit of prophecy? Okay, the Holy Spirit. Second, a false 
interpretation of God's Word. If you want to, on the next to the title of the seven results of apostasy, put the reference, the Seer of Patmos, page 292, so that you can go back and study this list. Seer of Patmos, page 292. So now we have a false interpretation of God's Word. Thirdly, the exaltation of what? Human reasoning. Oh, I can figure this out on my own. I don't need anybody else. Fourth, the love of what? Worldly faith. Worldly customs. Worldly customs. Number five, the desire for what? Money. Money. I, I'm, I'm really sad, saddened a lot when we have a lot of Seventh day Adventists running after quick money. I, I'm amazed at how many Seventh day Adventists, well meaning, will go after schemes that if they just join this or do this or do that they'll get a lot of money. money. Mm -hmm. And so they spend themselves doing that instead of Bible study. Mm -hmm. sure. And when they don't get the money, they're at each other's throats because they didn't succeed. <laughs> That's none another none whole it, thing. <laughs> Nothing about glorifying God. Number six, the desire for positions in government or in being involved in political issues. This is all part of it. We've already shown when you get yourself involved in political issues, you are no longer and cannot be a Christian and Christ in you, the hope of glory. You are a pagan through and through. No matter what your profession is and when you go to church. Number seven, the demand of the crown. Once you get involved in politics, the next thing is, is you want to be the one in control. All you've got to look at politics today, and the apostate Protestant has representatives now, almost 14 apostate Protestants are part of the election of being, wanting to be in control of what? The, the presidency of the United States, the government. That's correct. It's not by happenstance. It's prophetic. These ingredients of apostasy are eternally deadly. It is not new, but a skillful replaying of what Satan did in heaven itself when he became evil in all his ways. Today, even in professed Seventh-day Adventist circles, we are sadly finding this working. Not rarely, not slightly, not somewhat, but widespread across all cultures and nationalities. Though God's professed church has not fallen into the grips of completely of Babylon, the works of Babylon are manifested openly and defended by the leadership, which we will know later. Trust me. You're not going to like this sermon when we get done. It will make you want to throw up just like Jesus wants to throw up. <clears throat> this should not come to anyone by surprise or should be offended that it is clearly set forth as fact when God's prophet wrote. Now the question we have to ask ourselves, how many of us here believe in the writings of God's prophet? Okay, everybody just about raises your hand. Now remember, you have made this testimony before who? God. Before God. So every quotation from the Spirit 
that was given to the prophet is God speaking through the prophet to you. Amen. And so when you get to a quotation that you don't like or have a hard time accepting, be very careful how you react. Because you're going against who? God. God. Sure. You're not going against me, the pastor. You're not going against the prophets. You're going against God. You may be mad at the pastor for bringing it out. You may be upset that the, that the prophet wrote it. <laughs> but that is not concerning. The most important thing is, is you're arguing with who? God. God. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 409. Many will stand in our pulpits. Now, when the prophet says many are will stand in our pulpits, who is she talking to? Seventh day Adventist. Seventh day Adventist. So that would be many will be standing in the Seventh day Adventist church, the pulpits of the Seventh day Adventist church, with the torch of what? False, False prophecy. In their hands, kindled from the hellish torch of Satan. Now you know where the sermon title came from. Sadly, because God's people have become almost completely ignorant of the historic Adventist message, therefore, when satanic inspired ministers stand before God's people, they will take as truth that which was inspired of Satan and is designed by Satan to damn God's professed people into believing lies as truth. Yep. The results of this deception breeds doubt and controversy and when these are loved, God continues by His prophet with a serious warning. Same quotation. If doubts and unbelief are what? Cherished. Cherish. The faithful ministers will be what? Oh, wait a minute. I thought we were supposed to stay in. Uh-oh. We got a problem. God said He's going to remove the faithful ministers from the people. Who what? Think they know so much. You see, when the laity of idolized ministers, they become gravely susceptible to the heirs unknowingly. Those who stubbornly grind themselves into such a deep attitude of Laodicea that their love of deception thought to be truth brings damnation because they think they know so much. Paul declares it this way in 1 Corinthians 8.2 If any man think he knoweth anything, he knoweth what? Nothing. Nothing as he what? Ought to know. Ought to know. <clears throat> you think you know what it means to keep the Sabbath. Let me give you a little insight on something. Even those that receive the seal of God which the sign of the seal is the Sabbath, will not fully understand what it means to keep the Sabbath until they're in heaven. Think about it. Everything on this earth is tainted with sin. And even though there would be no sin in us, that the Holy Spirit will fill us and seal us in Christ, we will still only see marginally the holiness of the Sabbath. So we hear anything else. And we think we got it good just quitting work and coming to church is keeping Sabbath. That's not even hardly even getting into the doorway. We 
we have documented how far for more than 70 years end time prophecy God establishes people with has been rejected. Ministers who preach this air are loved and preach on 3ABN widely. They are preaching air directly contrary to God. And dare I say, many are worshipped. For you bring some of these men within a hundred miles of this church. And you see how many people flock like dumb sheep to their services. Just to listen to a man they think has truth. And it's preaching here. Worshiping man instead of knowing the truth God gave. If you don't understand that, we've got the sermons online, we've got them on in the lobby. We've documented it. God's prophet wrote in Acts of the Apostles, page 535, while exalting the, truth, the, the sure word of prophecy, as a safeguard in the times of peril, the apostle solemnly warns the church against the torch of what? False prophecy. False prophecy which would uplift, be uplifted by false teachers who would privately or secretly bring in damnable heresies even to the point of denying the Lord. Continuing, the prophet of God in Acts of the Apostles says this, same paragraph, these false teachers, and I put in parentheses, having the hellish torch of Satan, arising in the church and accounted true by many of the brethren in the faith. In other words, this minister says, oh, this guy is great. And this one says, yeah, and this person is good too. And the laity take it hook, line, and sinker. This was written in 1911 by the direct help of Gabriel, actually the apostles was, sent from the very throne of God False teachers in God's church accounted by other ministers and laity as true. One hundred years later, 104 to be exact, the effect of these men not inspired by God, but Satan has all but destroyed truth in God's professed organized church. The mainline general conference organizational structure. I do not take this lightly, or with, but with grave mourning of sorrow. For there has been generations of deceptions perpetrated against present truth seeking people. As a third generation Seventh-day Adventist, I have been doing a lot of studying and I recount the messages I was taught as a child in the late 60s and early 70s. Every bit of it being filled with apostate air. And only in the last 20 years have I understood how subtly things have changed. But no longer is it subtle, but open. Why is it possible for open apostasy to be allowed? We're going to answer that question later today. You see, people who want to be saved, longing for the pure Word of God, have been given foul-smelling, rotten spiritual food as the meat of God's Word. God gave to His church everything it needed for growth in the glory of His light. But God's church chose to cast it aside for the knowledge of men. The prophet of God warns 
which now we see has come to pass. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 5, page 707. God will arouse His people if other means fail. What does He say? Heresies will come in among them which will sift them, separating the chaff from the wheat. God would have all the bearings and positions of truth thoroughly and perseveringly searched with prayer and fasting. fasting. In this church, we have documented from time to time certain of these heresies that have subtly and even blatantly come into and destroyed present truth. Note these last two quotations, Acts of the Apostles 535 and Testimonies, Volume 5, page 707. Study these two quotations side by side. Meditate on them and ask yourself, is the prophet of God right? Or is everything okay? Because you can't have everything okay and the prophet being right. True. You see, when God's professed people love the false ministers, the ones following Christ are removed. I didn't say that. God said it. Remember, we just read the quotation. When God's people love lies, God says He will remove those that love truth. Even greater heresies then come in and sift and separate those who stand for truth from those who love not the truth. There has been for generations a perpetuating of heirs as truth. Today we find that the majority of professed Seventh-day Adventists have no practical knowledge of the historic foundation which God established. Never forget this. Doctrinal titles is not the foundation. Doctrinal titles is not the foundation. Time has destroyed God's people by placing it into a deep sleep of satisfaction. Soon it will be eternally too late to stand for truth against the errors promoted in the churches today. Soon the deceptions will be so great that souls will be damned into eternal hell because they never gained a real love for present truth that so powerfully can change the life but never have been given the chance to do so. Present truth will be seen in the lives of only those who live a surrendered life. Yeah. Yet far too many, even of the most conservative circles of Adventism, are just playing games. That's why even in the Free Seventh-day Adventist Association, most of those churches are going to hell. Mm -hmm. sure. Because all they did is they come out of the mainline church and took all the apostasy with them that they enjoyed. So why do we know this is true? By the fruit of the world being presented as truth. You see, God has given us His people present truth for this very time in which we are living. What is truth for today that God's people need? God's prophet reminds us in Bible Training School, May 11th, 1913. May 1, May 1 rather, I'm sorry. The work of imparting the knowledge of truth. Present truth for this time 
is the all important work. Amen. All heaven is engaged in it. Not part. All heaven. Pop quiz. Who's in heaven? God. God the Father. Jesus. Who else? Son. Jesus. Angels. The angels. Who else? The 24 elders. The 24 elders. And who else? Elijah. The four beasts. Yeah. Which we recognized earlier is actually for other human beings right. with a higher level than even the 24 right. elders. Right. Moses and Enoch and Elijah, yes. Okay. All of these people are in heaven. And so when the prophet says very clearly, all heaven is engaged, then you know Elijah, Enoch, Moses, everybody's included in all of heaven. Have you ever thought about that? Yeah, we have some people going, no, I never thought about it that way. <laughs> Truth for this time is not to be lost sight of under an accumulation of interest that are of what kind of importance? Secondary, Secondary importance. These are not to be allowed to engross the mind while important issues are not advanced. Now, what are some of the things that could be of second importance? Jobs. Jobs. Yeah. Worldly education. Yeah. Yeah. Everything that does not bring glory and honor to our Heavenly Father. The Word of God places a lamp in the hand which lights the path heavenward. It allows of no diversion from the straight and narrow path in which God requires His people to what? Walk. To walk. There has never been a time in God's church when there has been no controversy. So don't be concerned with yourself because of controversy. Just know what stand you are and how you are standing. Amen. In fact, at the very time God was bringing forth one of the most critical aspects of the foundation of the faith of God's people in 1888, those who rose up against these messages claimed that they, the 1888 message, was destroying the old landmarks. But instead of confirming this idea as what the prophet of God would have done if it was true, she wrote this. The 1888 materi manuscript materials, page 518. The passing of time in 1844 was a period of great events. Opening to our astonished eyes the cleansing of the sanctuary transpired in heaven and having decided relation to God's people on, upon the earth. Also the first, second angel's messages and the third unfolding, unfurling the banner on which was inscribed the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And in case you missed it, the first reference, God's prophet strongly reminds again in the same paragraph, one of the landmarks under this message was the temple of God seen by His truth-loving people in heaven. The ark containing the law of God, the light of the Sabbath, the fourth commandment, flashed its strong rays in the pathway of the transgressors of God's law. The non-immortality of the wicked is a land, old landmark. I can call to mind nothing more that can, can come under the head of the old landmarks. Here the prophet of God directly lists what are the old landmarks of God's church. 
And so now we go to our second list. The old landmarks of God's church. These aren't God's church's landmarks. They're God's landmarks. The first being the cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. Now, before I go to the next slide, I want to ask you, from what we just read, I want you to see if you can, were listening. What was the number two? Because trust me, I have missed this for 25 years. It was only this week I found it. In any mortality? No. The second one. The second one listed. Go back to the first the slide. Don't, don't give any hints. Just go, go on. Go back to the next slide. No. Wait a minute. Don't we have all seven in there? Go back. Forward. 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 Right there. Stay there. Okay. Don't go backwards. <laughs> Thou shalt not let anyone cheat. <laughs> it's relationship to people on earth. Thank you. Number two. God's people's relationship to the cleansing of the sanctuary on earth. That is a landmark. Very few identify it. I did not realize it until this week. Number three. The three angels' messages of Revelation 14. Number four. The commandments of God. Now, if I'm going too fast, raise your hand and say, Whoa, horsey. Okay, we've got somebody needing me to slow down. We need to remember, we need to get these, and we need to study these, not just today, but through the week. Until we got them cemented into our minds, and then we, we use the materials provided to help us understand each one of them thoroughly. Amen. Sadly to tell you, the pioneers wrote very little on God's relationship to, God's people's relationship to the Day of Atonement. You'll only find it in the context of one doctrine. That's the 1888 message. Unless you accept the truth of the original 1888 message by Jones and Wagner, you will never understand your relationship to the Day of Atonement correctly. Number five, the faith of Jesus. <laughs> Not faith in Jesus, but the faith of Jesus. Amen. Number six, the Sabbath of the fourth commandment. This is distinguished between the commandments of God for a specific purpose because <coughs> Seventh day Adventists who are true before the throne of God will understand that the Sabbath is more than just. The seventh day of the week, we stop work and go to church. That's correct. The Sabbath with most Seventh-day Adventists are so lightly regarded, it's okay to spend the day at the beach and say you went that you kept the Sabbath. It's so lightly regarded that you can go to church and then get back home as quick as you can so you can spend the rest of the day in bed after you've eaten a bigger meal than you ate any other time during the week. <laughs> the Sabbath is so lightly regarded that the church leadership not only transacts money in the sanctuary, which is fully pagan, they count it. And some of them even deposit it on the Sabbath. Lightly regarding the Sabbath means a lot of things, and we are all in this organizational structure of Seventh-day Adventists, whether you be 
in the organized structure or not, there is a lot of confusion and a lot of lightly regarding. You live in a college town with an institution. The cafeteria of those institutions work harder on Sabbath than any other day of the week because the leadership wants to go have their conference meetings around the dinner table after church. God forbid. Lightly regarding the Sabbath means a lot of different things. And we need to understand there's an importance to the fourth commandment. And we will be held accountable. Number seven. <clears throat> the non-immortality of the wicked. I was talking to an individual a couple of weeks ago. And I said, you know what? Even this doctrine is distorted in our churches today. Because ministers of the Seventh-day Adventist Church preaching funerals routinely state that because this person had membership in the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they're going to heaven. And God said in His prophet, no, you are not. <laughs> membership on this earth means nothing for salvation. Amen. Amen. And any minister preaching a funeral says, well, because this person was baptized in the church, we know he's going to be in heaven. No, you don't. Paul warned us living today that there would be many deceived. Why? 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 10 is where we're going to go. Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. I'm going to ask you a trick question because I was impressed to ask it. What is the love of the truth? Yes, I want you to answer. I, I want you to see if you can get, if, if, if I have stumped you or you actually got it. Because what is the love of the truth? I'll be disappointed if my Sabbath school teacher doesn't get it. But that's okay. He's wrong over here. Okay, what, what, what you got? Thank you! Amen. <laughs> Individuals been here the least except for our visitors. Christ is the love of the truth. God is love. Amen. And unless we receive Christ truly completely in all things, we will not and cannot be what? Saved. Unless we see Jesus in every point of our faith, we have only man's traditional thinking and opinion. That's right. Verse 11, And for this cause, what cause? This cause. Not having Christ in everything. Right. Not receiving the love of the church. Not having the love of Christ in everything. God shall send them what? Strong delusions that they should believe a lie. Verse 12, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in what? Unrighteousness. We are living today in a great time of crisis among God's people. And in fact, I fear that the grave consequences will be felt because of choices made, policies enforced, and the pathway of the majority will be put on such a steep decline that few will be rescued. Mm. Have mercy. Mm. Paul ends verse 13 with this. Salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. This is what's needed. 
Belief in the truth is not as man has given it, but as God has given it through His Spirit. Amen. Present truth, the landmarks of our faith, are not just titles of doctrines as some would have you think. These seven landmarks are the firm foundation, the firm platform that is interlinked with each other and held together with Christ and Christ alone. Amen. Amen. God's prophet goes even further in identifying how these landmarks, the foundation of our faith, is established. The truth for this time. Or you can put in there, present truth. God has given us as a foundation for our faith. He Himself has taught us what is truth. A few are still alive who pass through the experience gained in the establishment of this truth. The standard bearers. Now, who, who, who are the standard bearers? What do we call them? The pioneers. The pioneers, that's correct. Yeah. Okay? We can put in there pioneers or standard bearers who have what? Fallen, Fallen death are to speak through the reprinting of their writings. What verse is she referring to in those words? Revelation 14.13. That is correct. You can put in the notes, in your notes, this quotation is from Notebook Leaflets, Volume 2, page 157. Put right beside there, the standard bearers who have fallen in death are to speak through the reprinting of their writings, and you put Revelation 14, verse 13. Ellen White didn't get this by her opinion. Amen. And she reminds you because the very next three words, I, I am, instructed. am instructed. Amen. This is God telling her, don't argue with this, that thus their voices are to be heard. Amen. They are to bear their testimony as to what constitutes the truth for this time. Then she continues, she says, We are not to receive the words of those who come with a message that contradicts the special points of our faith. Amen. The fact of the matter is, unless you have studied the writings of the pioneers, you have no clue what true Adventism is. I can tell you that from personal testimony. As a third generation Seventh day Adventist, it wasn't until I started reading the writings of J. and Andrews, Loughborough, James White, Uriah Smith, S. N. Haskell, A. T. Jones, E. J. Wagner, his father, J. H. Wagner, that you get a picture of Adventism that is completely different than what is Pope purported as Adventism. Oh yes, the titles are all nice and neat. But you can change, you can have the titles all the same. It's what's inside them. It's inside the book that makes the difference. Satan's inspired ministers are not dumb. don't think they are. Never forget this. There is not a single person living today that can know without reservation the special points of the Adventist faith. The landmarks given by God. The foundation of God's message. Without studying the writings of the pioneer men who God used to establish present truth for His people. 
And he did this between 1855 and 1905. And I'm going to prove it in just a moment. When these writings are studied without prejudice and without preconceived ideas, God will reveal His hand in the very development of His platform and foundation of present truth. And you will be settled unmovable on the solid rock of Jesus Christ Amen. by the power of the Holy Spirit unto salvation. You will see how the pioneers, J. N. Andrews and James White, did not have all the truth lined up correctly before they died. But they didn't stop preaching anyway. But God kept leading and guiding and revealing how things were brought out. And with Uriah Smith and with Loughborough later and with S.N. Haskell who was kept alive by the angel of the Lord so he could write books that we are to use even to this day. <clears throat> This week across my desk came a declaration where Fromm literally proudly declared that it was in 1944 that they were able to change the doctrines of the Uriah Smith's book to fit their theology. And he said proudly, we have accomplished it! With over 10,000 changes, theological changes, are made. The demons of hell was inspiring him to do it. And we have a whole denomination teaching air because of what he did. Furthermore, God's prophet declares clearly while the scriptures are God's word and are to be respected. Notice she's qualifying it. She's saying God's word is God's word and don't you ever slight it. says the application of them. What's to them? Scriptures. The Scriptures. If such application moves one pillar from the foundation that God has sustained these 50 years is a what? Great mistake. Great mistake. This was written in 1905. That's why I put 1855 to 1905. The 50 years she's referring to The application of the scriptures are clearly set forth in the writings of these men used by God, and we better be studying them. That's right. It should not be surprising of the great work Satan has done to destroy and discredit and change the writings of these men whom God chose to do such a great work in establishing His church for the special final work in this sinful lost world. There has been an heir that has come in as a tiny seed many years ago. This heir of the seed of heir was attractive. And I will personally tell you, I took it hook, line, and sinker years ago. Yeah. Because this seed looked like truth. <clears throat> but it has been adopted and given fertile ground to flourish. Today the seed is no longer small and innocent. But a tree of such proportions that it infects literally almost the entire Adventist belief system in the general conference system and out of it. Anyone claiming to be Seventh-day Adventist is affected by this almost wholesale. It affects without regard of your convictions, whether you be liberal or conservative. 
whether you be historic or not. Its powerful roots have intertwined itself with them all. And the tree is called the emerging church heir. The bottom line in the movement is this, that they believe that we are not even supposed to understand precisely what the Bible means. <coughs> this is a direct attack against the clarity of the Scriptures. And they evaluate themselves as if this is a noble reality. Notice these lists, this list that we are going to cover is not in every Adventist church, but they are one or more in almost every church. This information I'm revealing today comes from a multitude of sources inside and outside of Adventism. Then with the confirmation of acknowledgement, Adventist ministers are now acknowledging it. It's in the organized structure. Mm -hmm. It's influenced widespread worldwide. Mm -hmm. Number one, the emerging church movement is a denial of the clarity of Scripture. As said before, it is a denial that we can really know what the Bible really says. It removes the authority of the Scriptures and individuals' personal responsibilities of obedience. It therefore then allows a re-examination of the Bible and its teachings. And when you can deny that it's from God, you can deny it's clear. And then you have all the right to misinterpret it. Everyone is allowed to have their personal opinions without the regard of God's established truth. This I have seen personally, even in conservative Adventism. They have their conviction, and when you show from the prophet of God that they're an heir, they dare say, that's not, I don't care what she said, this is what is the truth. I've had ministers and laity and elders and leaders all tell me that. All inspired by Satan. Number two, the emerging church sanctifies culture. This is worldwide in Adventism. We have Korean churches, we have Spanish churches, we have Jamaican churches, we have every kind of church under the sun. And it's all because we want to have our stuff our way. And we're so proud of it, we will declare it. This is my Jamaican church. Or this is my Korean church. Emerging church sanctifies postmodern culture as if it's legitimate and says we are going to reach people. We are going to have to go where they are at. The concentration of relationship building over pro proclaiming the gospel, the inclusive approach to various sometimes contradictory belief systems calling your Baptist minister your brother in Christ is the emerging church heir. He is not your brother in Christ unless you are going down the pit of hell with him. <laughs> Remember, what did Jesus himself say? His family were who? Those who do the will of my Father. And unless you are doing the will of my Father, you are not my sister or my brother. You may be blood to me, but you are not my brother or my sister before God. It is my duty to reach to you so that you can become my brother or sister, but you are not at the time. 
We need to learn how to speak and know what the truth is so that we can be motivated with the gospel to reach these people. Yes, they are our brother and sister in humanity. But there's a difference between being our brother and sister in humanity and being our brother and sister in Christ. That is true. And let us not get the two confused. Stick to nature to each. And if you don't believe I'm biblically correct, we can sit down and discuss it and I can show you clearly. Study the life of Abraham. God called Isaac his what? Only son. Was Isaac his only son? No. no. Why did God not acknowledge Ishmael? He was not, he was not of the seed of God, but of the seed of man and flesh. The emerging church, number three, is love because it takes all the rules out. How is this done? The emphasis on experience and feelings over absolutes. All, and I, I had a, a brother-in-law tell me this, trying to reprimand me about something. <clears throat> he said it's more important to have a relationship in Jesus. Total flat air, going to hell, inspired by Satan. For it removes the absolute principles that God established this church on. The emerging church promotes human philosophy. Whether it be pre-modern, modern, or post-modern, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with the Bible. All are human philosophy. The whole thing starting from the pre-modern era of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. These thinkings are permeating in the ministers of many preaching in Seventh-day Adventist pulpits even to this day. Because they take in school philosophy. <clears throat> and they're not studying Ellen White's writings or the pioneers when they take philosophy. These are interwoven in sermons and teachings, making a more palatable theology for the world to let paganism come in. And shove God out the back door. Number five, the emerging church removes the solemnity of the worship service. Skits for sermons. Pastors telling jokes, doing magic tricks, mm -hmm. entertainment more than the simple gospel. Come to my church. We have great entertainment every Sabbath. We have great singers. We have great drummers. We have all of this going on. Yeah. And God says it's all demonic inspired. Mm -hmm. The shunning of the soul called stale traditionalism in worship, church seating and music, is completely, totally removed. The pulpit no longer exists. You don't need a pulpit in the emerging church. There is a reason why the prophet of God said that the minister was to be dressed a certain way. There's a reason why the God, prophet of God says the ministers must kneel beside the pulpit before he enters into the desk. There's a reason why the prophet of God has given direct instruction to the minister. Because without it, <clears throat> he is in danger of being inspired by Satan and not God. One minister, when Ellen White was on the platform, got up to speak and went directly into the pulpit and was ready to say a word. And she says, get down on your knees before you come into the pulpit. Number six. 
number six. The emerging church tears down historical, theological beliefs and doctrinal structure. A de-emphasis on absolute and doctrinal creed. This list actually has about 15 different, 15 different uh, categories. I combined some of them and some of them I left out. These seven are, are all existing in the Adventist church today. Number seven, the emerging church leadership skillfully rewrites the history of the church. I did not put it on the screen this week. I'm not sure when I'm going to put it on the screen, but I will <laughs> refer to it today. The rewriting of the history of what happened with Jones and Wagner and the so-called apostasy of them both was a skillful and artful work done to destroy the work of the 1888 message to its core. Amen. I have official papers from the son-in-law of E.J. Wagner where he testifies in writing under oath before God the truth about the divorce and remarriage of E.J. Wagner and he was not at fault. He was innocent of everything and never apostatized from the truth. <clears throat> and in fact, to his very dying day, he was promoting Christ in you, the hope of glory. The 1888 message. His son-in-law goes into great detail of exactly the truth about the divor his divorce and then remarriage. And A.J. Wagner had full and complete biblical grounds to do so. A.T. Jones, also, who this gentleman knew personally, never gave up the Sabbath and was preaching righteousness by faith until the day he died. Do not be surprised to see them in heaven with you. Their characters have been assassinated. Their writings have been distorted and changed. All to promote the heirs that are so loved by those who are popular in the church. We have documented well the fact of the rewriting of the history of the church in past sermons, and I'm not going to take time to go over it all. <coughs> But the lies that are promoted of men, God's people as truth is growing both openly and subtly. The question at hand is, are you, am I, going to allow these deceptions to affect our spiritual health? Or are we going to be like the Bereans of Paul's day? and ground ourselves by the power of the Holy Spirit to settle ourselves into the present truth that God has given us. Amen. You see, we must daily be choosing from what source we get our strength. Amen. Daily we must surrender our lives to the sovereign authority of our Heavenly Father. Daily we must be born again dying to all that is of self and self-interest and follow our Savior, cooperating with His work in our behalf on this great day of atonement. God invites you today saying, I have set before thee an open door. Will you walk through it by faith? Like our pioneers' fathers challenged from God, that we saw last Sabbath. 
Have we seen every open door as a reminder of the door that is open in the most holy place this week? Have we seen our sacred responsibility to cooperate with our high priest? Or do we just walk through without even a thought? What has been the case for you? Revelation 3.8 again. Our Father knows you have only a little strength and has kept you. His Word have not denied His name. The only strength strong enough to overcome all the evil and sin in this last generation is Jesus Christ in you. Amen. Jesus Christ in me. Our only hope of glory and eternal life. Verse 10, Because thou hast kept my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation. There, we have already discussed the hour of temptation. And I believe not a single one of us that were listening to that sermon said, oh, I knew all that. Because we painted a picture that's serious. The great time of trouble is not something that we can just push off as, oh, we'll get through it. Not without God's help. No Every moment of our lives we will be living in the shadow of death at the very moment of the close of probation until we see the face of our Lord. And we will not have a high priest to forgive us of sin. To remain sinless before our Father for just under the space of one year must be understood as fact and not fiction. True. <clears throat> I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. He would never have had to write that if, if it wasn't true. If you don't have to be kept from the hour of temptation, that means you can sin until Christ comes, and that's not what the verse says. That's right. which shall come upon the world to, to try them that dwell upon the earth. There's a time coming, a time of trouble that no one can adequately prepare for. Our Heavenly Father knows this and has promised to keep you safe in His saving power while the wicked are suffering His wrath without mercy. Verse 11, praise the Lord, He put verse 7, 11 in Behold, I come quickly. Thank God you're coming quickly. Hold fast to that which thou hast. Let no man take thy crown. Amen. Hold fast, my brothers and sisters. Hold fast that nothing of man's devising under the influence of satanic power will divert your minds from the present truth gospel. Victory is ours by His faith living actively in our lives. Be faithful. Hold on to the rock of Christ. Stand firm when all the around desires the easy path. Oh, my brother and my sister, let us live by His faith. Amen. Be ever faithful, sealed in His truth. Amen, amen. and amen want God's truth in our lives and nothing but God's present truth. Some of us may have never heard this kind of thing before. It's not a pleasant thing to tell people that everything that you have learned is a lie. But that's in fact what's happened in God's church. Men with the torch of Satan has been teaching God's people. And the question we have to ask ourselves, are we going to believe lies or study for ourselves? I pray each one of us will take the time, because each one of us has time. It's a matter of reorganization and making things priority that needs to be priority in God's sight. 
to study these things for ourselves, not just depend on what is here on Saturday. Amen. Let us kneel before the throne and commit our lives. Loving, merciful, and gracious Heavenly Father, you are truly the head of the church. You have given to your church everything it needs. With your strong arm, your, your Son has opened the door of the most holy place and the light from your throne shines forth everything that we need unto salvation in this darkest hour. Help us, Lord, to re trust your leading. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, have your Son, Christ, His life and death alive in reality in us that we will crucify self not just once a day, but moment by moment, continually choosing the divine nature of your Son to actuate our every motive and every thought of our life. For surely this is the only way we can be born again and be in you. Profession is an easy road, but it really leads right straight into hell. Forgive us, Lord, for so desiring the easy road of the past. Place us on your path. Destroy everything of this world in our lives and make us one with ye. We pray in Jesus' name.